Good afternoon, Michael Veach here. Hope you had a, a good uh, Yarra Valley Writers Festival yesterday. It was a packed program, but we had a terrific time. We've had some wonderful feedback, so we trust you did as well. Who knows, we might be able to keep the tradition going. Uh, so as promised, this is the second of our Sunday story times. And um, today's story really is a shout out for uh, another thing we're offering, our uh, Sunday writerly sessions. So on the 24th of May at um, uh, 3pm, we have a, a, a terrific session, Why Short Stories Have a Big Impact, featuring uh, the writers uh, Josephine Rowe, Alice Bishop, Sean O'Byrne, with Alice Cottrell from Kill Your Darlings, having a chat to them. And we thought we'd take one of uh, Alice Bishop's uh, short stories from this book, A Constant Hum, which is just one for Alice Bishop, the um, Herald Sun Australian Young Novelist of the Year. And when you hear this story, you will not be surprised as to why. It's a collection of stories on her impressions of the Black Saturday fires, her involvement, her direct involvement, and also her impressions of the community and uh, uh, the legacy it left on the landscape and the, and the people. It's called Just a Spark, and I'd love to read it to you now. So here we go. Um, Alice Bishop's A Constant, uh, from A Constant Hum, Just a Spark. In court, Linda learns too many things about Jake Holden, the man responsible for her daughters and her grandsons, along with her son-in-law's deaths. At first, she thinks it'll be best to know everything about the kind of cigarettes the man in the prosecution stand likes to smoke, Pall Mall, about the disturbing way he's been known to talk about women, referring to them often as dyke bitches under his breath, or that he'd been beaten in school he was a proper outcast, as one local man, now almost 40, like Holden, remembers. But as the case develops, Linda wishes she knew less about the man in handcuffs with an unreadable frown. The smaller details stop her from being able to sleep, even for the few hours per night she'd mostly managed after the fire folded over her horizon. A series of wide-eyed journalists pull at Linda's dress, floral, billowy sleeves, as she walks from the first day's courtroom session. Is Holden a monster or a misfit? What would your daughter want to see happen to him? What about your husband? Where is he? Do you wish the bloke had just plead guilty? The questions hit Linda as she heads back to the car park and her old Nissan skyline, its paint peeling from valley sun. The first few days are long. Coroners and firefighters and police and SES they all blur into one. After the cramped sessions, listening to character statements about the man who ruined her family's world, Linda drives out to the highway McDonald's to sit in the invisibility of the car park. She watches people come and go, paper trays holding strawberry thick shakes and crumpled bags filled with sesame seeded sugary bread. Linda imagines what it'd be like to feel normal again, just for a moment, she has no energy even to unclick her belt. But the car park provides refuge. She doesn't think of Pall Mall cigarettes, of what was left over of her daughter after. She is almost okay again in the quiet anonymity of the bustling forecourt, cocooned in the odd familiar comfort of her car, the same one she'd had in her life before. As each highway side evening darkens, Linda watches her diamond-shaped face in the rearview mirror fade to near nothing. Sometimes, as passing cars light up the skyline's bonnet in dusty waves, she lets herself go back to the year before, with Haley still calling her after work, religiously, at six. Hey Mum, how do I cook an eggplant? What are you reading? How are things? Can't complain, Linda would always answer to the last question driving back from the Churchill nursing home where she had worked. But looking back, Linda wishes she could say, Hey Haley, you know I love you. I love you and isn't it great that we're all still here? She wishes also she'd told her daughter to move from that bushy valley bungalow that Haley had taken, that teaching job in Melbourne, not the tutoring work at the local high school. Linda wishes she'd said, Get out of this little town, Haley, honey. Get out before the flames. Between 10 and 11pm, another day of the trial behind her, 
Linda leaves the McDonald's car park and takes the freeway back to her cheap hotel on the city fringe. The Faulkner Best Western is sparse, but Linda doesn't care. To her, motels are meant to be for holidays, for celebrations, not for nights spent mostly awake, nursing a grief so fresh she often feels like she's been thumped in the chest. She doesn't do the usual things she once did before, the, before bed, undress, wash her face with cold water, or brush the metallic taste of not enough food from her mouth. Linda just pushes her sandals off, undoes her zip and lies back on the too firm double bed. There is a hint of normal, though, in morning routine. Washing, drying, mascara, then underwear, dress on, a cup of tea, then a handbag found muesli bar. With the ash and smoke, Linda stopped enjoying cooking things, the meals she used to prepare for her daughter and her grandson, along with her son-in-law, before everything went. Driving to the overpriced courtside car park, she hopes there will be some, some sense made of things in the session ahead. She hopes the man, Jake Holden, who set the bush on fire during the state's hottest day on record, says sorry. She hopes to see him broken, crying, feeling unshakable remorse. Some nights in the light sleep she's becoming used to. Linda dreams that Holden is crying, begging and apologising. I'm so fucking sorry, he says, and Linda in her dream says over and over, I didn't hear you. Say it again. He keeps crying and begging and shaking. In other dreams, though, more common ones, that now familiar stranger is stuffing cotton wool balls down Linda's throat. He's standing over her, then a great grey shape. She can't breathe. He's lighting something, a tiny curling match. Our darkest day has a darker underbelly. What verdict are you hoping for? If you could say anything to Jake Holden today, what would it be? Do you think he's showing remorse? The journalists outside the magistrate's court don't stop yelling questions at Linda as she arrives for each session. Two women she vaguely recognises from Churchill stand in the smoking area near the entrance. They don't look like they belong in the city. Ill-fitting David Jones skirts and caked on foundation, making Linda realise she probably looks the same. The taller of the two, in shimmery silver-pink lipstick, nods at Linda as she walks through. Linda, overthinking the day ahead, misses her opportunity to nod back. Later, after the sentencing is delivered, after it all, this woman will walk over to Linda. Through the proceedings, Linda will have heard that the woman in pink lipstick's name is Carol Wright, and that the last she heard of her 22-year-old son was his crackly triple zero call, replayed to her so she could identify his voice. Linda smells tobacco and peppermint oil on this stranger's top before they step back to look at each other through watery eyes. This time Carol's not wearing any makeup. It's the end of the trial. She grabs Linda's hand, cupping it between hers. I hope that fucker burns in hell, she says. Linda nods this time, trying not to think about bodies, anyone's burning. Jake Holden is just under six foot and 39 years old. He has clipped back receding hair, a pale pinkish face and arms that seem slightly too short for his height. Sitting across from the yet to be convicted arsonist, Linda wishes her husband of 35 years, short and soft and always smelling of paint, was now not her ex. She watches other people in the courtroom audience press their damp faces into their partner's shirts. Linda turns away when wind-marked men in work boots and clothesline faded polo shirts kiss their wives' foreheads as they sob for the loss of family, friends and friends. Sixteen people had died in the fire that glowed like a furnace across the hill. The victims' ages are listed off by the lead prosecutor at the beginning of the hearing, a lottery ticket of the disappeared. 67, 68, 54, 16, 12, 58, 82, 83, 
25, 29, 4, 7, 14, 34, 1, 36. Are you aware of the gravity of this situation, Mr Holden? The same prosecutor asks. These questions, do you have any remorse, are asked in the lawyer's monotone. Without pause, the questioner goes on to mention Holden's ties with the CFA volunteer program, about how he'd signed up two years ago but only showed up to training for a month. Weren't enough fires to put out then, the lawyer in low wedge heels and a tight beige dress asks. Did you take things into your own hands, she asks. There is talk, then, of the people filling the courtroom, of their lovers and children and mothers and fathers, all gone. When an old photograph is shown of the arsonist, smiling in his CFA-issued mandarin-coloured coat and helmet, Linda looks down at the floor, at her sandals, at the aqua blue veins showing through the tops of her feet. Linda had known the story that the man on trial had volunteered as a firefighter only lasting that one month, before he went back to his part-time job packing the dairy fridge at the local IGA. Shame! Someone yells out from behind Linda. Shame! The deep voice repeats, its crackling tone giving away the broken-heartedness beneath the yeller's rage. There is a shuffling, then muffled voices, as the yelling man in a dark navy t-shirt and tracksuit pants is led out of the court. Linda looks over her shoulder to see the back of the leaving man. She watches him as he stops at the courtroom door to steady himself, hunching over like he's about to vomit after a big night out. It makes Linda remember her daughter, Haley, how she had come home one night, maybe at 14, 15, or was it even 16, smelling of her friend's stolen Midori and stomach bile, Memories like these had started dotting Linda's days. The moment Haley took her first step, the smell of the impulse she had covered herself in at 13, the day Haley announced a little too proudly that she was vegan, animal rights and all, before proceeding to the fridge for a pot of yoghurt. Come on, bud. The two young court assistant encourages. Everyone looks across the room, the quiet crackling with dark excitement. The assistant is shining, doing his job perfectly. Although probably 23, he looks to Linda like he's 15. Let's get some fresh air, mate, he continues, and the man who had yelled across the crowd stands up, unfolds. Linda waits, hoping, but the man who said what was on Linda's mind does not look back as he walks, shuffles really, past clean-shaven security guards and out of the courtroom doors. It had been almost 47 degrees on the last day for Linda's daughter, Linda's grandson, her son-in-law too. Elderly people had been dying from heat and birds had been falling from the sky. This is how the prosecution lawyer sets the scene. Before tracing Jake Holden's day, her account goes like this. 10 a.m. Holden is seen driving his mother's Ford Falcon up and down the Churchill Main Street. Driving unusually slowly, Holden is noticed. His ridgeback dog sits up on the passenger seat. All four of the car's windows, according to the witness, are rolled down. 1.23pm, security footage from the local IGA shows Holden enter the store. Wearing a faded billabong t-shirt, he makes a purchase. The store owner has reprinted the receipts, a picnic bar, Pall Mall cigarettes and two big lighters, pink and blue. 1.50pm, Holden is recorded ringing triple zero, reporting a fire near the corner of Judd Grove and Henderson Road, a 20 minute drive from the place Holden bought both cigarettes and lighters. 4.30pm, as the fire burns out of control across the gully, Holden lodges a Crime Stoppers report online. His statement tells that he saw a pair of suspicious men in a white ute heading up the mountain with silver petrol cans. The security footage taken from a propriety nearby shows no white ute, no men, no petrol cans. Holden's mother's Ford Falcon 
driven by Holden, along with a ridgeback dog, head out of the window, is, however, shown passing by. Linda, Linda looks down at her feet again as the lawyer speaks. She's too afraid to see Holden, scared that his white pink face will not be showing regret or sadness or despair. A single Pall Mall cigarette. This is what the defence lawyer says started the fire. That Jake Holden threw the cigarette out the window without thinking that 47 degree day. There is talk of remorse of a good man who made a simple human error. That's when Linda looks up and across at Holden himself, his check shirt too bright and his almost smirk making her head ache. If you ask her, Linda will tell you about the process of identifying her daughters and her grandsons along with her son-in-law's remains. She will use that word, remains, because the thought of her daughter's body burning makes everything go white. She talks about this in her victim impact statement, read out to the courtroom on the fourth day of the trial. It's a sunny April morning outside the William Street building. Office workers carry cardboard trays of coffees and plastic boxed sandwiches as Linda walks up to the stand. Her shoes are flat chemist bought sandals and her dress is flax soft, bought with her daughter Haley back one weekend when they drove to Rye. The fabric is loose on Linda now, her body made small from grief. Nothing but the truth, Linda repeats back to the judge before speaking about finding her family's remains like charred and felled tree trunks beside the road that had once led out of their Churchill house. Linda looks over at Jake Holden, made blurry by her held back tears as she speaks about the white noise that follows her everywhere. Ma'am, can I order you a taxi? One of the courtroom attendants asks at the end of the trial's fifth day. Linda shakes her head. She needs to be still for a bit. The afternoon has been testing, with primary school portraits of Jake Holden being shown to the jury, and his high school teachers, neighbours and own family all coming up to the stand to testify. Jake wouldn't hurt a fly, Holder's mother, Holden's mother, soft and kind looking, wearing a mustard yellow dress shirt with plastic beads, even says. She speaks about her son's hardships, his inability to fit in, when the defence lawyer asks Mrs Holden if her son was likely to throw a cigarette, pal mal, out of the car window by mistake, even though it was a 47 degree day, there are a few moments silence. Mrs Holden, the defence lawyer continues, I know this is hard for you, but would your son do something like that, knowing his actions could kill 16? No, the soft looking woman in the mustard shirt continues, Jake would never hurt anyone. Hey lady, a man calls, knocking his knuckles on the skyline's passenger window. Linda is in the usual highway side McDonald's car park, sitting quietly to try to forget. She wants some distance from the last day in court, being in the same room as the man ruled responsible, 16 counts of arson resulting in death, for taking her daughters and her grandsons along with her son-in-law's lives. Hey lady, the man continues, though he's to Linda just a boy, his maroon name tag reads Dylan and he looks bored even as he peers through the open crack of the window. Customer parking only, he says. And as he turns away, Linda is again thinking of scrub fire, of ember storms, of the sirens that never arrived, but she somehow still dreams of a low animal wail across town. Alice Bishops, A Constant Hum, that was the first, uh, the second actually story from it, quite exquisite, <laughs> I don't know what to say after reading that, Just a Spark it was called, it took me a moment to readjust, I'd even forgotten the name of the short story, thanks for listening, we'll have another one next week. Good evening.